middle class bengali girl leaves a cushy job in london comes to delhi uh, to become an entrepreneur convinces all the merchants to come on time for meetings which i think is revolutionary in india and then uh, goes on to build such a fantastic company in lime road thank you very much suchi for coming on aws startup spin really appreciate it vikram always a pleasure to talk to you thank you very much i remember you said somewhere you are in the dopamine business i think it's the perfect business because we are all secreting a lot of cortisol at the moment so <laughs> <laughs> so really i mean and uh, you are a golfer and i i love this game but this is a game i never tried for too long because it's a very very tough game and uh, you know i played it for a little while and there was one key take out from this wonderful game was that ability to let go and that's the reason probably i did not play it well the bad shot that i played before affected my current shot mm. and i i, I really take uh, this fr- away from this game because this is something i apply to tennis and i try to forget the last uh, ball and te- uh, you know golf teaches this lesson all the time and it uh, applies to life right that you forget your past uh, break up that you've had or for that matter your past deal and focus on the deal at hand golf i'm sure has taught you a lot of lessons It'd be great to hear from you Vikram, it's so interesting that you talk about this. You know, forget the last shot, right? And I remember uh, in one of my coaching sessions, I was um, uh, I was practicing the um, my short game, and I would hit a ball, and then I would wince, uh, and then I would look at my coach, uh, and then I would make a face, and then I would hit the next ball. So this continued, right? Oh, and then I would look up and say, "Oh, is this okay? Oh no!" You know, there was this continuous murmur and and commentary that was happening, right? At one point, he just put his foot down and says, "Okay, that's it. Now on, I don't want to see any wincing. I don't want to see a frown. I don't want to hear anything where you're looking to me for affirmation. You literally are going to hit one shot, then wipe it off." then hit the next and all i want you to do is to experience your wrist and you know i was practicing with a glove under my arm for arm contact you know all of that experience the glove the wrist the club the ball contact and forget i'm there and forget what happened with the last ball and you know i and he walked out he literally walked out the next 30 minutes were probably the nicest 30 minutes i may have experienced in my entire life wow because it's in that meditative zone and if you can get into that zone where literally you hit one and you forget and you come back again and you hit again timothy galloway wrote a beautiful book called inner golf right and and before i started playing i read i read uh, it my my husband uh, introduced me to it and you know what he says is there are two selves right there's a self one and a self two the role of self one is actually to always tell you what you can't do are you're not you're going to you're going to miss are what Kya happened player hai yaar tu kya fault to player hai kya kar ke aaya hai how did you miss it it was such an easy sh- you know that stuff right oh can i do it again oh my god last time was a tukka you know all of that noise and then there is this it, self too which is the only self that needs to be activated which is non judgment and so how do you shut down self one and activate self two so i think it's been a tremendous experience playing this game and what it's told me is that you know 90% of this game is the mind right and that must be true of most things in life absolutely and i love that book that you quoted you know the ability to keep the self one away from the self two is the ultimate goal in life isn't it i mean aap dono baat mat karo that is the ultimate uh, moment where you can play sport or do anything in your life properly and i remember virendra seva telling me this yaar ki main ye self one self two ke beech mein na mera bahut conflict hota tha isliye main gaane gaata tha क्योंकि एक बार मैंने गाना गाना शुरू कर दिया ना ऑटोमेटिकली मैं सेल्फ वन को भूल जाता था सो इट वाज हिज वे ऑफ एक्चुअली नॉट हैविंग दिस फेलो अफेक्ट दिस द अदर गाय एंड मेनी गोल्फर्स हैव सीन से दैट बिफोर यू टेक द शॉट यू स्टार्ट सीइंग द ग्रीन्स अराउंड यू you start counting the trees around you बिकॉज वंस यू स्टार्ट काउंटिंग द ट्रीज यू विल टेक अवे ऑल द बैक थॉट दैट यू हैड so everybody has this amazing way but when you say that that changed your entire life means so much right and in, even in business you must be experiencing this 
Vikram, absolutely. And I think what it's taught me is something that we knew in theory as a, you know, as an entrepreneur, I knew in theory as a business builder, I knew that, you know, this thing about love the detail and, you know, get inspired by the vision, but love the detail. And, you know, golf is the detail. It's at that moment, just enjoying the moment. Because if you're not there in that moment, that each detail matters, right? Your wrist matters, your uh, your grip matters, how far you take the club matters, what angle you take it in, do you bring it in, do you bring it out? You know, everything matters. Your stance matters. Your, you know, you know, is your left leg a little bit more bent than the other? Everything matters, right? What you ate last night matters. And all the detail matters. And yet you have to stop all of that analytical detail and be in the moment to play. I think what it did is it, it really helped me enjoy each and every, like, you know, people say, you're going into a meeting, I would never take my phone with me. So I, I don't look at, look at my phone. But that's just level one concentration. Level, there's a level two concentration, which is where you cut out the noise, right? And you're able to really enjoy every, every bit of that without any noise in your mind. It's meditative. I don't know any other way to say it. And, and it's most pleasurable. It is it is better than any high, I think. And I, I think that's the one thing I've taken away from golf. Yeah, it's the, I mean, it's the closest sport to meditation. You do everything in silence as well. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Really, let's talk about a very important facet of an entrepreneur's journey, and that is their childhood. And I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, get affected by that one moment in childhood, or for that matter, some kind of motivation they had. And, you know, research has also shown that uh, uh, people or families who celebrate curiosity have created entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And you've spoken about your mother playing a very important role in uh, your life. And you also said that her match today is still better than yours. So clearly, there has been a major influence. And I'm sure there's a film or something that she showed you that changed your life. My mother was heavy into films. She used to say that the world classifies into three sets of people. People who look at others and learn and learn fast. People who experience it and then learn. And then people who never learn. And he, her, her motto was, you know, please always aspire to be in the first, uh, first group, right? And so her way of training us was, uh, was actually to watch a lot of films. And I remember at the time when we were growing up, drugs was a big thing, right? Drugs in schools and colleges. And I remember she made us watch this entire film, right? And then at the end of this, uh, it, it was a series of episodes. And then at the end of it, she says, I want you to remember what happens to this guy at the end. And I want you to remember the end so that you don't have to relive to get to the end, right? And I remember, and, 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 that, and that was it, right? And, and, and I, I think both my sister and I never, you know, were never really um, interested in even trying, right? And, and that was her way of saying that if you know the outcome, right? If you can fast forward and you know the outcome and you learn from other people, you just learn faster, smarter, right? The other thing I think which, uh, which, which happened very early on in my childhood was uh, they allowed for a lot of independence and in, on, almost insisted on it. And I remember that um, I was 13 and my, uh, and my dad decided um, that I needed to learn how to drive. So I actually learned how to drive at 13, which is completely in, incorrect and, not, and should never have been done. But I remember banging into something, right? And uh, having my first you know, mini accident. And like any other kid, I got totally rattled. I hit the car. And his thing was, you never give up on a bad day. And you had to get back. And I need you to drive now. Like not, not tomorrow, but now. And what that instilled in us is that it's okay to fail very badly. But it's critically important to get up and try again, right? And you cannot let that be the last experience you have, right? So um, I, think, I, I think there were remarkable pair, uh, people. My father is no, no longer with us, but um, yes, I did end up learning a lot. That is so beautiful. I mean, he taught you great at that age. And first of all, you know, hats off to your mother. I think she's a visionary. She should have been the HRD minister of this country years back. I genuinely believe 
make movies and educate this country you've got a lot of talent make movies on uh, you know all historical figures don't irritate people by giving them those books to read just make films this is the best time of audio visual medium and i think if she taught you through cinema it is a revolutionary thought hats off yeah no absolutely and it's so much more fun it's absolutely, so much more yeah. fun <laughs> yeah, i agree that to that uh, you know your father mentioned something which is the backbone of sports and entrepreneurship and that is grit never give up right and you've learned it at such a young age many people don't even get exposed to this concept and the great michael jordan said that you know when people stop practicing after they're tired my intensity of practice goes to the next level and to me uh, even the, the great mohammad ali how many push ups do you do mohammad ali he said that i start counting when i'm tired and this is that quality right that quality after your uh, the comfort zone is over makes you gritty makes you never give up and creates a champion entrepreneurs know what grit is tell us something about this you know uh, so firstly i think uh, the the interesting thing about grit is that it's very very badly understood and for middle class girls like myself right uh, particularly bengalis who are considered to be academics right so it was always you know this iq and this you know you have to be academic right and uh, that was the thing but there is this lady and there's a great ted talk on this um, a lady who became who left her career in consulting uh, angela uh, duckworth and then she went on to uh, teach and teach children and as part of that she did this extensive course in psychology and uh, and and studied uh, you know west point military academy recruits uh, she then uh, studied national um, spelling bee champions and what she found is that there was a remarkable correlation between this thing called grit less iq but this thing called grit and the kids who actually or the recruits that actually made it to the end right and 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 she started to define this grit as this ability which is a combination of passion and perseverance right and and she then took this to uh, inner county schools and said look the children who are underprivileged the children who make it despite the odds are the children with this grit right so the question then became how do you teach grit can grit actually be taught like is it even something and then it turns out and and you know i have often thought about it because i feel that our generation the generation before us we've not seen a war right we've literally you know you come out of college you've not seen a massive recession yet you've not seen your job eroded and nothing else there we've not seen adversity right and when you don't see adversity how do you create grit and what the closest in business to it is this thing called a growth mindset right that if you believe right that no matter what your brain will always find a way to find an answer and in fact thrives in finding an answer then you you become grittier and grittier and grittier because you are faced with a challenge you say you know i don't know the answer but i know that i'm going to figure it out and it makes it gives you the courage to try again and the courage to try again so um i think that's what we 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 really talk to uh, our 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 youngsters in lime road and we talk about this growth mindset and there's a lot of literature on fixed mindset versus growth mindset but to give you a simple example right so lockdown happened lockdown 2 happened nobody anticipated it we were going to go into the market and launch our new product the minute lockdown 2 was announced this product had to be launched everybody most people said okay that's it this thing will get delayed there were two guys on the team who actually said and i said is this going to get delayed and they look at me and they said no they completely changed the channel wow they were going to send 50 people on you know feet on street on the ground they changed it and we discovered that video calling works extremely well right despite the lockdown and so this channel that we never ever thought would work 
worked beautifully for us. Our numbers were higher than what we'd expected. So I think if people believe that the brain will find a solution, I think there is this natural sense of, you know, you keep persevering, you keep finding an answer. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a hallmark of what makes great entrepreneurs. I think they just don't give up. If they believe in something, they just go with it. And I think Beautifully described. Absolutely. And I, I remember, I think it was to do with uh, Ms. Duckworth only, where she said that uh, talent plus effort is equal to skill. Skill plus supreme effort is equal to achievement. And that supreme effort is great. Because that you can you can reach a certain amount of uh, excellence because of the effort you've taken. After that, that factor X factor is what makes you a successful person, and that is beautifully described. Perseverance is a word you know. Uh, you can't simulate this in schools and colleges, but sport does it right wow. because you know that if you play sport, you will learn automatically the meaning of perseverance. This is a very good story, actually, um, uh, about Tiger Woods and the Indian contingent. So I think Tiger Woods was at the Delhi Golf Club. So he came to play here. And then so the Indian guy, the Jyoti Randhavi, et cetera, were all there. And so they meet at breakfast. And then they chit-chat at 8 o'clock. They're sitting there at the annex and they're chit-chatting. And they're saying, oh, OK, did you sleep well? Does that? So the, and then somebody turns and says, sort of, did you sleep well? And he said, yeah, I slept well. And he said, so uh, when do you wake up? Something like that. He said, oh, I woke up at four. And he woke up at four and he was at the range. He was at the range. And he had hit his, you know, he'd practiced, he'd done his thing. And then, you know, so, so this whole thing about perseverance, that look, it doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. I am going to keep doing what I normally do, which gets into this practice mode. But I think people who have practice and perseverance are literally the winners in business, I think, or business or sport or wherever, right? This is so true when it comes to champions. And I, uh, I remember speaking to Kaushiki Chakravarti, the classical musician, and uh, uh, Zakir Hussain Saab was also there. And I asked Zakir Hussain Saab that, you know, what do you, how many hours do you practice? And he laughed at me and he said, I never stopped. So the Riyaz is always in your head. When you're sitting on the tabla is when it comes out of your system. But you're always doing Riyaz. And I think that differentiates the champions. As Toshiki would say, that in our Guru Shishya Parampara, we don't have Riyaz ever yeah. so, How powerful, how powerful it, is that? It's such a powerful thought. And I was like, oh, going to two-hour class and all is Riyaz or what? <laughs> so she yeah. said, no, it's not. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and do you know now, con, now, now look at that with what we teach in our corporate culture, which is work-life balance. Yeah. How different is that, right? Yeah. Ki ek there is the 10 hours or 12 hours of work and then that is not life, yeah. right? And the rest of it is life. Whereas they are saying, I'm doing riyas all the time, right? So I think excellence needs that. There is, I think there's no shortcut. Let's talk about practice. And we all know in sports that it's not practice that makes champions. It's purposeful practice that makes champions. There's this amazing story that Tim Grover talks about who coached Michael Jordan. And he said when Michael Jordan was tired, after he got tired, I would give him a couple of puzzles to solve. Because the mind needs to be sharp enough when your body is tired because that's when the decision making happens the best when you're playing live sport. And I thought that was brilliant because nobody would probably do that kind of purposeful practice for thinking on the spot. Similarly, the great Alex Ferguson talks about when he was asked, you know, when does, uh, why do Manchester United people score goals in the last 10 minutes? He said, we practice for it. I would tell my boys just 10 minutes to go. I want two goals. But that is what purposeful practice is all about. It's not just about turning and playing 400 balls in the next. And I want you to take us through what your thoughts on purposeful practice, especially maybe from a lens of an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think I love that example from Sir Alex, this whole thing about practicing what that last 10 minutes is going to look like, right? Yeah. And you know it. And when it happens, you've done it. It's not, it's not a surprise anymore. So look, I'll tell you one story in golf and then we'll talk about purposeful practice in sort of personal life and then in, in business, right? So in, in, in golf, I remember like every other rookie, I used to go and hit 200 balls until I realized that it's just useless, right? And then when you hit 50 purposeful balls, and you hit one, 
and you take a break and you think about it and then you hit another those 50 are probably way more a effective b powerful for practice than the 200 that you hit without thinking without thoughtfulness without and with without that routine right there is a particular way now your stance your you know what you look at how you you know what you are visualizing all of that right so i think that is that is one thing i learned in golf personally there are a few rituals that uh i practice and i practice because i realized that rituals have the power of triggering what may not be obvious right in your brain so a simple thing before going to bed having a shower now in delhi when it's 3 degrees you don't want to have a shower but the reality is that having the the act of having the shower tells your body and your entire system that is ready to wind down right and it's supremely powerful that that single purposeful act or practice is 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 extraordinarily powerful at lime road there are many purposeful rituals that we do right so we have an all minds we never have the all minds on a friday and we always have it either on a monday or a tuesday and why because people came back to us and said that when you do the all minds on a friday we get so pumped and so excited but then there's the weekend wow <laughs> at that point at 5 o'clock on a friday i feel like i can fly i have so much energy and i'm ready to and then so can we just do it on a monday right and so we purposefully now do it on a monday because it triggers so much uh, you know I, i don't know cortisol and energy and uh, uh, you know in our people similarly a daily stand up right daily stand up uh weekly sprints so we are very very methodical about a few things like that and because we've seen that when you do it again and again and again that purposefulness creates a lot of puts puts a lot of things it creates uh routine discipline in the day it creates a certain kind of behavior um purposefulness in covid for example right purposeful practice in covid became first 10 minutes of every meeting was about storytelling because people were so you know everybody went home everybody felt isolated this is in the peak of covid 2 and we felt that you know men everybody was talking about mental illness and you know issues with depression and all of that so we said we're going to ta- start telling personal stories there had nothing to do with business and that became a purposeful act because if you don't do it purposefully what ends up happening is you say yaar aaj nahi karte right and what ended up happening is that that simple act of storytelling caused the next 50 minutes of the meeting to be infinitely more productive wow lots of trust lots of feeling of i'm part of a community there is a team that's looking out for me they're interested in my life i've shared something i feel like part of a i genuinely feel like part of a bigger cause so i i i find that these rituals are extraordinarily powerful in personal life as well as in business wow this storytelling idea in a meeting is just too good i mean it just it would just change the dynamics of the meeting right i mean everybody is come out with their 10 minutes i mean everything that's going on in their head is out of the way and then the next whatever half an hour is the most productive period because you know all the negativity or some things that are in your brain are just out of it that's so beautiful one of the important things of the sporting world is rest which the corporate world does not give importance to and coaches i know for a fact that they would give equal importance to practice as they would give to rest whether it is between tournaments or whether it's between points as you know tennis players count racket strings even between points to deactivate their mind and just to relax before they can plan the next point do you know whether it's an entrepreneur or whether it's a elite uh, golfer or a, a cricketer i think it's just the way the brain circuitry works isn't it um and and i think uh i i did not understand the power of rest at all right and uh for the early part of my career uh i was you know i, I would revel in sleeping four and a half hours and then back to back meetings and packed days and you know i'd come out and i you know the the fact that you were packed itself you know gave you some version of a high but it was an adrenaline driven high it was not a real real material high 
And then I, I think it was only later when I started playing uh, actively and I started meditating actively, I realized that even if it's two minutes of deep breathing, right? So there's that five, five, five way of breathing or in golf when you're practicing and you hit one ball and then you take a break. Like you literally do a short walk, you come back. It changes it. And it gives you the earthworm type mentality of having forgotten what happened in that last ball. And every ball is a new ball, right? It's like life's giving you infinite chances at this game, right? Because every ball is a new ball, right? And so I changed my entire practice for meetings uh, on the back of that learning. And so what, what ended up happening is that I've now started keeping a buffer between meetings, right? So I'd have a meeting and I would have a five to 10 minute buffer because it's that reset of the brain. And that reset is just so, so powerful, right? And I've, I've read a lot of literature uh, that says that, there, you know, when you sleep, there are these spindles, et cetera, that, that actually, actually what determines your plasticity, right, in your brain, it determines your memory, it determines your ability to recall. I just don't think we, we maybe, when we are younger, we underestimate it. Uh, and... And I think uh, often sleep deprivation, at least I, I was in investment banking in my earlier part of my career, it's, it's connected to bravado, right, in some ways. And I think it's the most misunderstood uh, thing. I think, I think rest, and there is this power of subconscious, right? So, and I have seen that you go, you go to bed with a problem and you, you can even, some people I know actually actively talk to their subconscious and say, I, 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 I am asking my subconscious to find the answer to this problem. I've not done that like that, but I wake up at 4.30 and I have an answer. Wow. So there is this power of rest, right? And, and Einstein's famously known to nap through the day, right? So who are we to change it? Oh, that is uh, beautifully said because the power of the mind in the sporting world is amazing because I've had Zaheer Khan tell me that I would tell my shoulder before sleeping that you've got to recover in the morning at least a wee bit. Wow. And only then over the next two months, my shoulder recovered. And I give a lot of, you know, that, that whatever, talking to the subconscious at night, give a lot of credit to that as well. So clearly it's working even in a real sense. I mean, and I'm sure the once you give the message to the neurons that when I sleep, I'll get a little bit of work and answer. I'm sure they do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you spoke about so many things where you were at point A and in the journey of entrepreneurship, you tried to get better and better. And that's what self-mastery is all about. And interestingly, the points that you mentioned were not in direct connection with your business, but they also have a connection. So like the Roger Federer's of the world would say that the one thing during self-mastery that worked was I had to overcome my anger. And Sachin Tendulkar talks about it all the time. He says, my father drilled into me saying that I don't care how big a cricketer you become, whether you'll become a good human being will define your legacy. And I think these are very important points told to uh, these sports people at the right time that along with the journey of excellence, your journey of being a good human being also matters a lot, which means working on your emotions, which are not in your control. In your journey as an entrepreneur, and I know, I know that you've got years ahead of you, were there anything specific that you worked on and said, hey, this is not good, but in that journey, I got to make it better? Lots, right? And uh, so let's take about people decisions and, um, right? People decisions. There is so much mental bias that kicks in, right? In the early days, I actually feared I was fresh off the boat into India. I knew nobody, right? And, and I felt, you know, the early team, I said, you know, Let's give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's keep, and so how long do you do that, right? How long do you do that? And so that emotion, that, that the, the fact that you're giving them the benefit of the doubt and you're giving them retries, right, is coming not from a point of calculated business thoughtfulness. It's coming from a point of some degree of insecurity. And insecurity causes your brain to think in a particular way, right? And it took me a while to catch that, right? To catch that and to say that it doesn't matter that this is a different country, right? It's okay to make these people decisions and to get them wrong, 
right? And it's fine. But what is not okay is to not make people decisions fast enough, right? And so to catch myself in the moment of that self-doubt, right? Is it the right thing to do? And say that, okay, no, it's okay. This result is not working. We need to change it fast. And the changing it fast, the very act of changing it fast increases the probability of success, right? And to be okay with it, it's this combination of being new, creating a bit of insecurity, being unsure of yourself. You have to catch it at the moment that it happens. So it's very deliberate practice when, you know, every time I'd sit down for people decisions, I would just ask myself, is this coming from a point of lack of certainty, lack of surety? So that's one. Second is, I, I remember earlier on in my career, uh, this piece about active listening, right? And, um, and I, it didn't come naturally to me at all. And, you know, you'd be in meetings and, uh, you know, you think, I think that I've heard everybody, but people are not feeling heard. All right, but I'm saying, but I, I can re, I can, I can tell you whatever what you've said. You say, yeah, but I didn't feel hurt. I just felt that you decided what to do, and so that took a lot of active practice for me, right? And so there is a book which is slightly cheesy, but it's called Seven Behaviors of Effective People or something like that, which I read many, many years ago, Even right? Others. Yes. And that's chapter five. I still remember it. Right. And he says, and I started practicing. He says, when you go into a room, imagine you're an elephant with very large ears. Mm. And so with those large ears, you wrap the room around and just quietly observe and use the Socratic method of asking questions as opposed to telling. It was a big journey for me. Right actively practicing that and what I ended up finding is that the solutions eight times out of ten are infinitely better so that's been another practice that you know I've, I've had to do through my through my uh, business career wow this sounds like Bill Campbell as well Socratic questioning and then arriving at an answer and deep listening is what no but I've always uh, try I tried this once when you deep listen no the other person starts thinking they're talking sense <laughs> 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 that becomes a problem sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> See, we're already going in with the assumption that they're not, right? <laughs> <laughs> True that. So, I, Suchi, I'll come to an important aspect of entrepreneurship, and that's partnership. And we see that in, uh, you know, at Wimbledon, where you, you'll have a lot of people around a tennis player, those small partnerships that make a champion. And in your business, it's about closing partnership deals, right? I mean, and I know that I quote, quoted it in the beginning of the show about you making people respect time. And obviously that came from the fact that they also trusted you. So partnership has to be a deep rooted philosophy in a company which you've successfully done so far. I want to know your thoughts on partnership and in that context, uh, your partnership with AWS, which has been so successful as well. No, AWS have, have been great partners and uh, no two ways about that. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, it's been a journey since, since our very early days. You know, I think partnerships, if I were to grade myself personally on a scale of zero to 10 in terms of how much I've done, I, I would grade myself a very low single digit number there, right? Because I think there is a ton more that can be done, right? And partnerships are, are uh, you know, are about who you partner with, right? How much time you spend thinking about partnerships, how you partner with them. So, you know, for example, you know, with our sellers, we at one point realized that working capital was so important for some of our sellers that we actually were the first ones in this country to launch daily payment reco. Right? Nobody else in this country has it. So which meant the daily they would get cash back from us versus most companies release cash in 15 to 30 days. Right. But I just think that there is a ton more to be done. And I think partnerships come both at the entrepreneur or the founding founder or the founding team level in terms of finding the right mentors finding the right coaches. You talked about a um, trillion dollar coach, uh, you know, um, Bill Campbell. The amount that Eric Schmidt and that team learned from their partnership with Bill was amazing, right? And I just don't think I've done that big. And that's actually one of my missions for this year, right? Which is how do I surround the business, myself, and my L1 team 
with a very, very rich set of partners, right? And do both for business. So on the sell side, on the buy side, both for business, but also for learning, right? And growth. And so that's actually int very interestingly enough, one of, one of our core goals this year. How do we leverage this ecosystem and, and uh, partnership greatness? Wow, that's a great point to have in your culture, right? I mean, if, if partnership becomes like a, one of the key aspects of your culture, it will uh, build multiple levels of uh, effects right, right uh, to the last mile. Yeah. In many ways, it comes back to what my mother had said, which is learn faster and learn fast from others, right? Because that's, that's one of the big powers that get unleashed with good partnerships. One important point, and uh, which is a little difficult question for you, but I'm sure you uh, have answers for that because an entrepreneur relies on something which people don't like to hear, on luck. Because a lot of sportsmen I've spoken to, I, I could say 100% of them say that luck is very important. And I'm like, you guys are facing the ball at 150 kilometers per hour. You're doing everything right and practice and purposeful practice. Then why do you give that factor so much importance and I've thought over this for a long time even when you see Moneyball you have a great statistics analysis of the team but then the price in the market has nothing to do with the stats there is that x factor and there's something that has happened which has made that person more successful and it's difficult difficult to understand this but I would want to understand your perspective as an entrepreneur can you plan for luck is there a methodology to make luck your friend mm. So we'll go back to Sir Alex's example, right? At Manu, right? Manu had more victories in those last 10 minutes of the game than possibly any other club in England, right? And some would put it down to luck. But it was deliberate practice. They just practiced to turn around the game at the time, right? Now, you could say they got lucky, or you could say that they actually practice, and every time they practice more, they got luckier, right? Yeah. Um, at at Lime Road, the way we think about luck is the following. And, you know, one can say things happen to you, or you can say things happen for you. And when you think that things happen for you, it enables you to start to see opportunities associated with it. And I think the more you, you're in that mindset that things happen for you, the more opportunities you see and the more opportunities you create. So actually, at, at some point, some, a friend of mine had once said that there is a course on how to get luckier. And I was very interested. I said, what do you mean? And he said, it's a practice, right? It's a practice. The more thoughtful you get, the deeper you get into a problem, the luckier you get. Because it's not the luckier you get, it's just that you find answers. So my view on this, and you know, I, I don't think I'm a big believer of astrology or stuff like that, I don't know. But my belief is that to a large extent, right, uh, you, you can create increasing amounts of luck, right? By unleashing the stuff that either blocks you, right? So things like your mind, things like your own inner fears, your insecurities, these are blocking you. The day you unblock that, you get luckier. It feels like you got luckier, right? Uh, or just plain grit and just being at it. You know, you in business, you hear about overnight successes, but they're not overnight successes. They've been at it for 13, 14 years. I mean, Zomato is finally going to do an IPO. It's been in business 14, 15 years. Right. And so I think I think, you know, if I had to choose a side, I'm sure there is some random X factor. Right. Uh, you know, did the food that you ate last night, did it work well for you? Did you get a stomach ache before an interview? And I'm sure all of that happens. But but if I had to choose one, I'd say there is a method to getting luckier. And that method involves working very, very uh, aggressively on how your brain thinks, how your mind thinks, how you think about what is happening to you in the environment, and how much as a businesswoman, businessman, business you know, leader, you make of each opportunity that arises. So in many ways, we think that COVID has been the biggest and the most, you know, it's been the luckiest event. And even though it's been terrible, right? Terrible, untold misery, in some ways for our industry, it's been, you know, a, you know, a huge boon. So I think, 
I think it's just how you see the world, right? How you see the world. And ultimately, I'll just leave you with one thought. You know, you change the narrative, you change the outcome. And so uh, I think you change the narrative, right? That, you know, I think you summed it all, uh, Suchi, that luck is, uh, you know, some of the parts of all that we spoke uh, so far. It's purposeful practice. It's great. And uh, to sum your sum, summed up story, uh, there is something that uh, the great Sachin Tendulkar told me once when I asked him about how do you deal with pressure? He said, earlier I used to feel pressure because of the number of people shouting my name as I entered. Then I thought to myself and said, why are they shouting? They're shouting because they have expectations out of me. Now, every time I go into bat, I think they are behind me. The moment I get that lens when I'm going into bat, the noise does not affect me because they are my own people. Change so, the narrative. Change the narrative. Thank you so much, uh, Suchi, for answering all these questions. Your thoughts on uh, uh, dovetail with golf and business have been exemplary. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. And Vikram, as always, lovely to talk to you and thank you very much.